Hey guys, Dr. Ben Sherhammer here. Just a quick video about PSA, what it means, and uh, what you can do about it if you happen to get a PSA test. These are the most commonly asked questions that my patients have asked me over the past few years. I put them together, answer them on this presentation. Hopefully it, it helps you out and clarifies things whether you're coming in to see us in clinic or someone else. So first things first, what is a PSA test? PSA test stands for prostate-specific antigen. It's actually an enzyme made by your prostate, and it actually helps um, it helps liquefy semen uh, to help sperm swim faster, so that um, so that you can have children. So uh, PSA, and and its pure form is basically kind of like a, a reproductive molecule. Over time, what we have found is that the PSA test um, in some men, their PSA level will actually go up over time due to um, things like enlarged prostate, um, prostatitis, inflammation, so on and so forth. But one of the things that can actually make your PSA never go up is the possibility of prostate cancer. And so for my job as a urologist, it's to kind of help you figure out if your PSA elevation is due to um, prostate cancer or you know one of these you know other causes. So the next question is, does a high PSA always indicate prostate cancer? The answer to this is uh, emphatically no. Uh, many things can cause a high PSA. I've mentioned a few. I'm going to mention a few on the next slide here. But a high PSA does not always indicate prostate cancer. Typically speaking, when you come in, we'll get things like an MRI of the prostate. Maybe you have this, this test. Um, we may do a digit rectal exam. There's kind of a myriad of other tests that we can do to kind of help discern this. And so one of the things that we'll look like look at if you do happen to have imaging of the prostate is your prostate size. We'll calculate something called the PSA density. And if it's less than 0 0.15 or less than 0 0.10, um, even if you may have a larger prostate, um, your PSA would consider to be no, low or, or low normal for your range. The other thing is that the PSA number will actually go up throughout the course of your life. So average values in 40 year old men are not the same values in men that are 50, 60, 70, and 80 years old. And so, you know, in the chart, if your PSA is above four, it will flag you as an abnormal PSA. For an 82 year old man, a PSA above four may be just totally normal for you. Uh, but if you're a 42 year old man or a 52 year old man getting the same test, then, you know, then that, that test would be uh, abnormal and we would, we would want to work that up. What else can cause an elevated PSA besides cancer? So this is, you know, a really uh, important factor. And so, and really is kind of my job when helping you work this up. One of the things that can cause an elevated PSA is, you know, recent infection, recent trauma to the perineum, because that's, the, you know, the area where prostate sits. Um, prostatitis or sort of irritation of the prostate, recent ejaculation, um, enlarged prostate or what we call BPH. Um, things like that. So not every PSA elevation is, you know, is, is, is going to be due to prostate cancer. Very common for us to see your PSA number be steady for many years, have a bump up, and then come right back down to normal levels. So, um, so yeah, so it's, there's, there's lots of, you know, variability here. Um, so yeah, additional tests. Uh, my go-to for an additional test at this point, you know, as of March of 2025 is, uh, is to get an MRI of the prostate. What is an MRI of the prostate? An MRI of the prostate is where you actually sit. Um, so there's a CT, you go through the donut. Um, MRI, you sit in the tube. And it's a multi-parametric MRI. So they give you contrast. Look at your prostate under multiple different phases. So there's um, ADC, DWI, T1, T2. And the radiologist really sort of puts together that, that constellation of different images that you'll get. So they'll put together the ADC with the DWI with the T2 images and assign a score to your prostate. So that score to your prostate could be um, anywhere on a scale of one to five. And it's called the PIRED score. So PIRED is we're currently in PIRED's V2.1. And, uh, and what that PIRED score would just indicate, you know, sort of the varying degrees of, of prostate cancer risk. So PIREDs 1 and 2 are actually both considered to be benign. At this simplest form, PIREDs 3 is maybe slightly more, you know, of concern than benign. So maybe like a 10 to 15% chance 
on biopsy that that lesion would come back as positive. Pyrides 4 would be like a 30 to 40 percent chance and then pyrides 5 uh, depending on the location within the prostate would be like a 70 to 80 percent chance of, of finding prostate cancer. So MRI is is kind of our go-to and, and the reason why is because it tells us if there's a lesion and then also where it is um, in, in, the, in the prostate itself. So we would follow that up with um, uh, using a fusion biopsy software. So we would line up your ultrasound image with the MRI image and then could sort of direct um, to where, where your prostate cancer or where your prostate lesion potentially was um, just, just using that software itself. So um, very accurate and very helpful, you know, if there, if there is a lesion there. Um, outside of that, you know, there's a myriad of sort of other tests that you may sort of read about, 4K, PHI, um, XODX, select MBX, so on and so forth. If those are of interest to you, have you sort of talk to, talk to you, you know, through those tests and, and you know, we can um, absolutely, you know, figure out what would be a good solution uh, for you. So say, you know, the PSA is elevated, the decision is to go ahead and, and get a prostate renal biopsy. What, what's, what are the risks of that? What are the benefits? These days you'll read about um, two, two approaches to prostate renal biopsy, the transrectal and the transperineal. Multiple trials that have kind of looked at the head-to-head -head differences between the two and, um, you know, information will kind of continue to kind of come out, um, you know, about the pros and cons of, of, either, of either risk. We, I, do, I do it both ways, um, and you know, the way I sort of like to set things up is that you know, if, if your disease is, if the possible lesion is on the top or anterior portion of the prostate, I think a transperineal approach is better. If it tends to be sort of the bottom base of the prostate, then, uh, then the transrectal approach is better. There are possibilities kind of, of infectious differences potentially between the two, where it's thought that the transrectal approach actually has a decreased infection risk compared to the transperineal. And so both sort of infection risk are between the two procedures are, are, um, are pretty, pretty low, um, but the, you know, the risk of that is, is never zero. So post prostate biopsy um, infection is, is basically the, the main risk moving forward. Um, after a biopsy, you would expect to have blood in your urine and stool uh, for a few days afterwards. That kind of varies um, for everyone. Typically it's not more than seven days. And while it's always alarming to have that, um, typically it's pretty rare for that to be so much uh, blood and whatnot that it would cause you to have issues. No restrictions after biopsy, and, and, um, and really we don't see many men, um, and then in terms of pain and, and um, other sort of complications, it it's tends to be a very well-tolerated procedure. Certainly there are always exceptions to every rule, but um, in general, you know, 99% of men do just fine and, and are basically kind of symptom free within one to two or three days afterwards. Are there lifestyle changes I can make to lower my PSA? It's a really good question. You know, my take on this is that your, your PSA number, it's not your cholesterol, um, it's not your blood sugar, you know, it's measuring this molecule made by uh, your prostate. And so, you don't necessarily have to, to work to lower the number if we've gone through the appropriate test to make sure that, you know, that there is no kind of further prostate cancer risk. So if you have a high PSA number and we've done the MRI, we've done whatever test, we've done the biopsy, it all comes back as, as benign. Um, this is, a, you know, a rather common finding. And, and, um, and so you don't have to spend your life worrying about changing your diet and whatnot to, to lower the PSA number. Um, so you can just, you know, kind of live with the fact that that number is high and, um, and that the reason may be due to BPH, et cetera. So you can sort of read through different dietary, um, dietary needs. You can read through, you know, supp supplements with different sunflower seed oils, et cetera. Um, but the, the main take home message is that you don't have to work to lower your, your PSA number. There are a few medications that can affect your PSA levels. The main one is a category of medications called 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, or um, most commonly th these days it's finasteride. Um, so it actually um, move your prostate number. Um, it will cut, basically typically cuts it in half. So if your PSA is normally 4, it would move it down to 2. And so that's just a good thing for you to mention to your urologist if you 
take those medications because we we absolutely want to we'd want to know that can an elevated PSA resolve in a cell yes yep and so sort of mentioned earlier in the video lots of PSA number numbers can uh, numbers can bump up and then bump right back down and so um, if you may you know be sort of in that category where it bumps up um, and so if that's you uh, that's fine. So we would just kind of want to follow you just to make sure that it's not continuing to do this, but would also just come right back down. So um, we've seen that happen many times, and um, you know that can that can definitely you know be be you. But um, you know just make sure to kind of follow things through the trend. Then the last question is, you know, what are my next steps? Um, we 100% uh, get that getting these lab tests from your primary care doctor, typically speaking. Um, can be scary because the, you typically get the lab tests and then they would tell you go on to see the urologist and the urologist may sort of order, order further tests and there's kind of a delay with, with you know, all these things. And so, um, you know, so like the first part is, you know, one to, you know, do, do your due diligence and get educated through, you know, just trusted resources. Hopefully like this is for you today. And then, um, then yeah, and then just to kind of, you know, continue to sort of, you know, walk things through um, you know, just with, with trusted providers and, and, and trusted doctors or uh, whatever team you may have. And uh, we're always you know, happy to help you get through. So thanks so much for listening. And um, if you're coming in to see us, I look forward to chatting with you. And then if not, hopefully this video helped answer some questions. Thanks.